Hello fanatics, welcome to True Crime Storytime with me, Cindy. I was going to do what I did with Scorpio and go through several offenders, I ended up calling them, but I came across this case and I haven't dived too far into it, but he is Aquarius, so it fits into the theme. But this is one of Denmark's most horrifying and most talked about murders in recent times. So, without any further ado, I'm going to start with his early life and move forwards. Peter London was born on the 15th of February in 1972 in Denmark. Um, I don't know what part of Denmark because I can't pronounce half of this. <laughs> um, they moved from Canada to the United States with the purpose of joining the United States Army where they could keep their Danish citizenship, unlike in the Canadian Army. The brother who he joined the army with was sent to Korea where he died from a virus while his dad was stationed at West Germany. While serving in West Germany his dad met Anna, his mum. They got married and later settled in Denmark. Dad got a job as a bricklayer and built the couple's house. That's very nice. In 1979, the master builder got a blood clot that incapacitated him and coupled with the family's financial struggles, their house was given a foreclosure. Following this, they decided to emigrate to the United States with their nine-year-old son, Peter. They bought a house on Essex Drive in Florida, Ormond Beach in Florida, where they ran a motel. In 1984, the family moved into a newly acquired house in Maggie Valley in North Carolina. A few years later, Dad decided to leave his wife, Anna, taking his son with him. Together, they initially settled in LA, where they stayed for a few weeks, and then they moved on to New York City. But... As it was unsuccessful, they tried staying in Boston. Their journey ended in Miami, where Dad found an apartment and got working as a bricklayer again. However, Mum and Dad got back together again, with the father and son bringing Mum down to Florida from North Carolina. In the meantime, the 14-year-old Peter had started studying at a school in Miami. During this school time in Miami, Peter worked various jobs in his spare time, including as a waiter at a restaurant. On the day he turned 16, he left school and instead began work as a bricklayer with his dad. It was during this period that he first became acquainted with drugs such as cocaine and marijuana. However, the family moved back to Maggie Valley again, where he started learning at the local high school. At this time, Peter started selling cannabis to his classmates. There's a whole lot of moving around. In in his very formative years, I must say. Oh dear. 
the murder of Anna, aka Mum, took place around April the 1st in 1991. The exact date has never been established with absolute certainty. Peter was 19 years old and there had been chaos in the family for a long time. Reiterating what I just said. Both of them often being drunk, Peter and his dad were violent towards the mum. The situation had previously been so serious that the family's neighbours had called the police several times but no report came out of the police visits. Domestic violence. It's hard to speak out against. Especially when you're getting beaten up by your husband and your child. I mean, imagine. It is suspected that a quarrel caused the murder. Anna wanted to cut... Oh my goodness. Not contact. Not move. She wanted to cut Peter's hair. Causing him to choke her. Together with his father, they drove the body to the city of Buxton and buried her on a wide sandy beach. On the 1st of November 1991, some passers-by who were on a walk on that beach near the lighthouse in Buxton discovered a body of a woman which had been washed ashore. The body was wrapped in a blue blanket covered with plastic and wrapped with tape and yellow rope. Peter and his father had since fled to Canada, but on the 6th of June 1992, they were both arrested at a Toronto hotel room. In July 1993, Peter was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. At the same time, his dad was sentenced to two years as an accomplice. Both were ordered to be deported to Denmark on completing their sentences. Dad finished his sentence and was deported, while Peter appealed both the length of the sentence and to being deported. He failed to overturn his conviction, but on the 16th of February in 1995, his sentence was reduced to 15 years. It's maddening. In 1994, Peter was interviewed by Danish TV channel TV2 during his stay in prison. The broadcast was called The American Dream and was about how young Danes had gone across the Atlantic. It was by chance that Peter took part in the programme. The Danish TV folks randomly browsed in a newspaper and it was there that they came across the story that a Danish citizen named Peter London had been convicted of murdering his own mum. The organiser then wrote a letter to Peter and asked if he would participate in an interview for the Danish television. Peter replied that he would like that and the formalities with regard to the TV recordings were then arranged with the American prison authorities who had a very liberal attitude towards interviewing inmates. During the broadcast, he coloured one part of his face black and the other white to symbolise, quote, good and evil, end quote. After viewing this interview, a renowned Swedish psychiatrist Professor Sten Levender awarded Peter 39 points of a possible 40 on 
the psychopath checklist the documentary was broadcast on tv2 on december the 14th in 1994 peter was released after barely serving half his sentence the state of north carolina at the time had a desperate lack of prison capacity the serious lack of space was due um, among other things to a very large number of prisoners from the u.s army who were convicted of wife abuse and murder most of these convicts came from the huge military base of fort bragg the authorities therefore had chosen to half the penalties for anyone who was imprisoned after a certain date and the law at the time did not allow convicts to serve in another U.S. state. On the 4th of June in 1999, he arrived at Copenhagen Airport, where he had been escorted by four U.S. police officers. After arriving in Denmark, Peter moved in with his wife, Tina, who he had married in 1996 during his prison service, and her teenage daughter. In the fall of 1999, during a violent attack on his wife and her daughter, which resulted in his being thrown out of the apartment, Peter moved into the men's home. While living there, he visited a brothel where he subsequently met Mary, Marianne Pedersen, an employee of said brothel. Marianne was 36 years old, an early retiree and had been a widow for a year. Her late husband was a former painter and even before his death, they started a massage clinic, a small brothel, where she earned money as a sex worker. Marianne and her two sons, Dennis and Brian, lived in Copenhagen. Peter and Marianne subsequently became lovers. On July the 3rd, 2000, Marianne and her sons were declared missing by her older stepson. He contacted police because he was worried that he could not reach Marianne or the boys on their cell phones. He had found a note on her front door that said they had gone on a vacation. Who would announce that? on the front door it's almost like come burgle me anyway the note was unusually worded therefore alarmed the stepson went to the house to look for the family he found the home in disarray with the furniture moved away from the walls trash laying all around vomit in both toilets and a strange smell in the basement. After filing a missing persons report, police began investigating the disappearance. Upon an initial search of the house, it appeared there were discreet bloodstains scattered around the house. Further investigation revealed bloodstains in Mary Ann's bed, her car and in the cellar. Traces of blood between the bathroom tiles and even on a chopping board. And a blender in the kitchen. Meanwhile, police went to Peter's home address and searched the premises. Peter claimed that they were on holiday and that he agreed to paint their house. 
but on the 5th of July 2000, Peter was arrested and detained for four weeks, charged with murder. Further studies of the house led to the conclusion that Mary Ann and her two sons had been killed and dismembered. The first dismemberment had taken place in the basement, while the other two in the garage. A recently cleaned freezer located in a shed at Mary Ann's property also had traces of blood inside. A deputy chief inspector told the press, quote, both places looked like slaughterhouses, even though Peter had tried to erase his tracks by cleaning up, end quote. From remnants of human tissue, the police technicians were able to observe that Peter had used an angle grinder in the garage and there were about a hundred visible cutting marks on the floor, revealing that he had used an axe. Peter changed his explanation after three weeks. He explained that he heard screams from the basement at night between June the 16th and 17th in 2000. And there he found two boys laying on the floor, killed with a knife by Mary Ann. She was supposedly unconscious after taking drugs. He then began to beat her because she had killed the boys. And according to his explanation, he struck her, quote, not seriously, end quote, and said she died shortly after. He didn't call the police as he thought they would not believe his story because of his past and instead decided um, to dismember the bodies. On the 10th of October in 2000, he confessed to killing them. He explained that he had quarrelled with Mary Ann because she, quote, had spoken sweetly, end quote, on the phone with another man. Subsequently, they all got up to fight on her double bed in the bedroom. And there he broke all three necks with his bare hands. After the murders, he placed the bodies in the house's freezer. This story was not quite corroborated by the forensic evidence. However, as it was reasonably determined that one of the boys had died in the basement and investigators found it unlikely that he had broken their necks the way he claimed. On the 19th of June in 2000, Peter went shopping and he bought an axe, rubber gloves, plastic bags, cleaning agents, after which he dismembered the bodies. Peter put the body parts in plastic bags, which he placed for bulky waste outside the house, which was driven for incineration. He then probably drove further around Zealand in Marianne's Ford Mondeo and placed smaller body parts in various waste containers. About 10,000 tonnes of rubbish, shall we say, were investigated, as well as a, another waste site. And with the help of the Danish Emergency Management Agency, the entire place was searched. The bodies of Mary Ann and her two sons have never been recovered. Peter's trial 
was scheduled for March the 5th, 2001, just a few days before the police and state prosecutor Eric hoped that Peter would admit his guilt and to deliberate manslaughter. However, it did not happen and the case therefore had to be decided by judges and jurors. The chairman started by addressing directly to the 12 jurors with the following remark. Quote, in recent years, few cases have attracted so much attention as this jury case. We will be dealing with that today. Of the line that applies to publicity of criminal cases, end quote. In addition, the president pointed out the concern about the influence both judges and jurors had inevitably been exposed to through the media mentions of the case over the nearly eight months since the arrest. Directly addressing to the jurors, he said, quote, by your subsequent decision in the case, they must not take into account anything that you have not been informed here in the courtroom, TV, etc. They also have to look away from what you had to hear or see outside the courtroom during the course of this trial. End quote. Peter insisted that he did not mean to kill his victims, but the jurors didn't buy it. They sentenced him as guilty of intentional murder and manslaughter. As a detail, he was also convicted of theft from the house. Prosecutor Eric said soberly and calmly to his criminal record procedure, quote, The circumstances, nature and extent of the crimes committed by the defendant are in a state of horror and fright. One can only respond to these as a society and take the right security measures by imposing a lifetime sentence. End quote. Peter's lawyer, I'll call him Hanson, is his surname, made a vigorous effort to get the jurors to sentence his client to a timed penalty of approximately 16 years. Hanson called his client's actions, quote, obnoxious and creepy, but nevertheless appealed to the jurors and judges to settle for giving Peter 16 years imprisonment for the murders. He compared Peter's three murders to the case of the doctor Elizabeth, who was sentenced to life for a murderous arson attack against his lover's wife and two children. Quote, killing by fire is an ag- aggravation. It is an expression of a carefully planned crime, while my client's actions are spontaneous and impulsive. Before the jurors retired to testify to the length of the punishment, Peter had the opportunity to say the last words to the jurors and he took advantage of it. Quote, We must all have peace now. We must all have peace in our mind and in our soul. End quote. The jurors and judges eventually chose to listen to the prosecutor. On the 15th of March, 
in 2001. After 10 days of court hearings, the three county judges delivered the verdict on Peter London. Life in prison. The sentence of a lifetime was unanimous and came after only 10 minutes of voting. All 24 votes were given for life imprisonment. In a jury trial, the 12 jurors each have one vote and three professional judges every four votes when the punishment is met. Peter asked for some time to think and even though he had the opportunity to appeal the sentence to the Supreme Court, he did not. Dear old dad was not convicted of being involved in the disposal of the three bodies. However, he was convicted of theft of several of Mary Ann's personal belongings, which the police found during a search on his residence. The judge believed that even though Dad, due to his age and other personal circumstances, would normally only be in a conditional punishment or community service, the circumstances of the theft was so serious that it had to be reflected in the punishment. He was sentenced to four months of unconditional imprisonment on June the 7th. In the spring of 2001, the National Association of the Execution of Peter London was founded by former convicted smuggler and heavyweight boxer Mark and some other people who remained anonymous. The association did not demand reinstatement of the death penalty in the criminal code, but it adapted a special law that would give the death penalty exclusively to Peter. Peter apparently believed that there was a death penalty in Denmark at the time, explaining this on a cassette tape in the prison. Due to this belief, he also thought Peter believed that he could not be convicted of murder if there was no bodies. And that's quite true, because without the bodies... You don't have a crime. And although they were never found, he left all the evidence. The police walked in and found blood everywhere, all around the house. It clearly dismembered because there was like... Yeah, it was everywhere, all over the kitchen. I'm not going through there, all the details again. But he obviously caught... He obviously committed a crime. Yeah. Yeah. You get you get my point. While he was in custody on July the 27th in 2000, he was attacked by several inmates. He was struck with an iron tube, which broke his nose. In February 2002, he was attacked again when he was beaten by fellow inmates with a frying pan on his head. He filed a case and demanded $10,000 in compensation for the harm done. On April the 16th, 2002, he was awarded 510 in Denmark money. I don't know what that is in compensation. In 2007, he was transferred to the top secured state prison of East Jutland. However, he has been subsequently been moved 
back. After the airing of the American Dream on TV2 in 1994, many Danish women contacted Peter. And in 1996, he married one of them, a woman named Tina. On September 28th, that's my mum's birthday, 2008, he was married to Marianne, another one, Marianne Paulson. But after 11 days filed for divorce when she claimed that he had lied to her about another woman whom he was lovers with while they were married. She told this on October 9th in 2008 when she appeared on the on a TV show. On the 26th of May 2011, Peter married a woman named Bettina. They were together from 2009 until the 3rd of October 2017. It it absolutely amazes me. Obviously, I am very much into true crime. I'm I I love the um it's a morbid curiosity and you guys who are listening you will get that you you will understand what i mean but would i write to um i don't know ian huntley and declare my undying love for him after he killed two children uh no i would not i would not contact anyone in prison because um, I might, in a true crime sense, but not in a romantic sense, because they're in prison. And then he comes out of prison, kills his girlfriend and her two children for, for no reason, and then gets all these love letters. It, it absolutely blows my mind. On August the 21st in 2006, he was sentenced to 40 days in prison by the court of Glostrup for holding 92.7 grams of cannabis in his prison cell. He was again sentenced to 10 days in prison by the same court on April the 23rd in 2012 for having 8.5 grams of cannabis and four amphetamine pills on the 26th of July 2011. Peter was accused in September 2012 to be behind the smuggling of cannabis and other substances. In November 2011, Peter changed his name to Niels Schaffner and that is a bit alarming because Schaffner is his mum's main name and there is a link to Niels I will look that up in a second add it on uh, but he then changed his name to something I can't pronounce he was a judge in the trial That's where I saw the name. He was a judge in the trial. And he chose his first name and his mum's surname. And that's what he changed his name to. Uh, He really is a psychopath. But there you go, guys. It's a very harrowing story of Peter London. Denmark's most talked about. He's horrific. He killed his mum, his girlfriend and two children. One absolute depraved individual. But thank you for keeping me company. Uh, As always, leave your thoughts and comments down below. And stay safe out there.